<laughs> Let me tee this up. I'm just going to provide a quick introduction and then we'll jump into the questions. And many people that you see in the room have added to a list of questions for you. So um, what, what time is it there in New Zealand? Uh, it's 11.30 uh, in the morning. 11.30, okay. I thought it was 14 hours, you're more. At least I'm, maybe I'm counting the wrong way. That's why? I know what's happening in the future. You're in the future, okay. <laughs> All right, we, we'll talk about the philosophical implications of that in another phone call. All right, so JL's the Chief Innovation uh, Officer at, at NetHope. Um, and he is uh, also in charge of the Center for the Digital Nonprofit. He's former CIO of the Nature Conservancy um, and also a uh, former uh, board member and founding member of NetHope and the CIO for Good uh, group as well. Um, he's, a, as you think you'll, you'll see from the discussion, he's a master of the provocative in IT strategy and vision, and I've known him for now 19 years and kind of among my friends since we first met at NetHope's founding in 2001. So we have a bit of history between us. Um, but welcome, Jay I'd like to have you with us. Hey, uh, I just really, I really, I do share beautiful black hair before we met me, and then I was just in Yes, right. Let's see <laughs> right. <laughs> a full hair, a black hair, right? <laughs> okay, uh, let's jump into the question. So uh, we've been reading that um, you can't achieve the strategic until you've mastered the tactical. And how have you bridged the vision to strategy, between strategy and getting things done? So you'll be happy to know that we started the semester by watching Simon Sinek's first Ask Why, his, uh, his TEDx talk, which is a, a great example of what you're talking about. Great. Well, we have a good technique that uh, we would see to where the six or, uh, or five whys was pioneered by Toyota uh, Manufacturing and Toyota as an others, which is when you face for the problems, ask the question why five to six times, and you go to your head get at the root cause of it. It's a, it's a very useful tool. It's very yeah. simple. And uh, so every time you have a problem in life, in work, anywhere, start asking the question why. Why is this? Why is that? Why is that? Why is that? And eventually you get to the bottom of it. It's pretty hard. 
Yeah. We'll come back to that when we talk more about, uh, about IT operations in a subsequent class. Um, so tell us a bit about digital transformation. What does that look like for a nonprofit? And how does a nonprofit know that they've arrived at this destination? To, the, uh, to one of the provocative questions on this list. Uh, so I heard in a recent conversation that strategy is dead. Why is that? And if true, 
Why should we study strategy? I don't know why you study history, right? <laughs> uh, history is, by definition, not <coughs> stuff, right? But it's really important to understand how human be beings behave in a social context. It's also important to understand the root of what you experience today. Let me give you an example. The democracy, which started around Roman and Greek, since that, you know, a little bit more than 2,000 years ago, still shapes the way we behave today. Yet, at the same time, we're seeing models of government and behavior of government leaders that are very different than what you would call perhaps democratic attacks. And that very that the behavior essentially in the last, say, four or five years is studyable through history in different contexts. So you can really understand what the current situation is by looking at the past. Now, it's still not exactly the same, but if you can get 50% to 60% right there, that gives you a huge advantage in the current context. And it's really helpful. But same thing with strategy, right? Strategy was a, a way to address business problem and third industrial revolution when stuff was moving slow. Right? Well, if you had a slow project, I don't know, what's your strategy? Which your projects tend to move fast? And so it can help you understand how people responded in the past to situations that you may experience in the future. It's that it's like history. If you don't like history, then... <laughs> but your, your point is, is that things are happening too fast now to spend six months doing an IT strategy. Yeah, so, exactly. So what's happening right now is very much like that. I, I, I encourage you to study biology before you study strategy, right? And ecosystem and trophic cascades and all the issues of biology. Because the world behaves more like a biological world today than it is with the uh, kind of foresight and planning and, uh, and the intent of uh, that is both the strategy. Okay. So what do you see as the key obstacles to digital transformation and how are organizations overcoming those obstacles? All the like me is the number one obstacle. <laughs> what, what's the center? Uh, the, the center is about baby boomers. I'm sure you all know right now. <laughs> okay, or something like that. It's just people just most people just don't get it, right? You all will get it. If you use that, you're born into it, right? But most people don't get it. And they don't really they don't control, right? They don't have to take the thing, they do the wrong thing with it. They, they don't understand how to behave. And that's the and most people are in charge, right? That's the sad part of it. Right? The, the CEOs as you know, NGOs of companies and others, if not CEOs, they're senior managers. And they're about 10 years to retirement, and the last thing they want to do is to change in their life, right? They want to cruise. So, so the last 10 years, they want absolutely nothing to disrupt. And they got to be they're out of a job and never get employed anymore. It's totally useless in the new economy. So that, that's, that's what's blocking it. Um, the sad part is that it's the same people who are saying that they really care about the world. Uh, but they're not employing that um, to themselves and their organizations. So you have these monster organizations that are stodgy, that reminds you of like the Genghis Khan bureaucracy, right? And actually, Genghis Khan was a lot more flexible than that. So perhaps uh, mm -hmm. the Roman bureaucracy. And, and they say, well, we're, we're agile and everything, because they use the words agile. And they actually need to do nothing. And uh, proof is this, right? To send that, to just imagine yourself, right? Meet a few senior managers of, of any organization who have any movement. And send them like a few LinkedIn profiles, Snapchat invites, and then a TikTok video, whatever, right? She can find out and reply. She can reply in two years, you're lucky. Right? Most people don't understand how this world works. And, which, and, that, and that's the number one problem. So, the number one problem is really digital skills of the people who are in charge of the pockets and the money. And, and frankly, you know, it, it, if it was not a little bit of a revolutionary to me speaking, I would. I would not say that, but we need a revolution. This is a perfect time where the young generation, so you and the younger folks, um, should, you need to take charge. Because otherwise, we're going to miss a huge era there. And then, much of the history in the past, 
you can study that. It's exactly the same thing that happened when electricity came in. When sanitation came in. It was exactly the same thing. So the young generation had to take over, and that created new models of things like the 60s and other research, of uh, assembly and others, and globalization. <coughs> That's why we retired, right, JL? To make room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we retired to make room. I still have a paycheck. I'm not retired yet, but. <laughs> okay. So um, something you did in the Nature Conservancy that always intrigued me is that you broke down projects, and maybe this is related to the speed question, you broke down projects into 90-day chunks. Why? And how did large vendor system projects work? Under that rule. So the right has to do with a, a very simple uh, mathematical effect called the core of uncertainty that you can actually predict what's going to happen in the next you know, 10 minutes. Uh, actually, you can predict the, path, the, the next um, you know, half hour or so of the course, but then you can't predict what happens after that. It becomes foggy and foggier. None of you know when you're going to be 60, when you're going to retire, what the world's going to be, when you're going to be. Uh, sure, you can watch your jets on and imagine what it's going to be, right? We always imagine a world that never happens, right? But so science fiction is possible, but the reality is we have no idea. So we're sure in that kind of uncertainty, so think about kind of advances like this, um, you want to shorten your goals to something that relatively you can control. And at the time, it's about 90 days that you can control. You, you should today, and that, and that was about 10 years ago when I did that. Today, I would say probably you know, a two-week period would be a good framework. Projects in two weeks. I have a question over that. Yeah. Right uh, job. Uh, what, what, met <laughs> what methodology do you follow for these 90 day projects? Right, sorry, methodology? Did, did you follow yeah. a specific methodology? Yeah, so um, don't follow any methodology, right? But uh, pick up the stuff that's useful. So agile, scrum, pretty useful to move very fast, right? But at the same time, don't forget to have a good gang share because it, it, a lot of people relate to that, particularly the boomers and others. So but that's one of the methodology. Today, we use design thinking a lot. That shows that we do planning in two days without the NGOs, right? It's just to give you an idea of the rapidity. Um, so design thinking is a good tool to learn today. So you haven't gone to a school of design and learn that in the university and try to audit a class and others. Um, Scrum and Agile are very good technique. We don't need to use for software development, they're good for management as well. Um, biology, look at how systems respond very quickly. Uh, right now you have a uh, virus coming out of China, and you see that the virus is propagating at a faster space than the government can respond, right? And so look at biology. Biology responds very fast to certain stimulus and others. So there's a lot of things like this that you should look at that give you the tools that you can uh, reuse later on. So don't follow a single methodology, but build yourself a series of tools that you have experience with that, that you can reuse in a different context. Does that help you mm -hmm. OK, so could you describe some of the challenges <coughs> faced with bridging the gap between technology and say supply chain. Um, um, yeah, let me leave that question at that. Yeah, so the, the supply chain in the uh, northern hemisphere in general, Europe and North America, it, it's very simple. It's called Amazon Prime. Um, you order it and it shows up at your door the next day. The supply chain in the real world, which is the rest of the world, is um, very complicated. Um, in, particularly in disaster situations and relief situations where from one day to another um, you may employ all the other vehicles that exist in the area, meaning there might not be any transportation left. Um, you might employ all of the goods that are in the area, meaning that the goods have to come from another country or another continent. Um, as you are transporting those things, you may not be safe. Safety may change. Um, something that by the way, Google Maps doesn't tell you because it's not important in the world it's really important in the southern hemisphere is where you're going to be shot at. Um, and, then, um, and then that road that you see in front of you may not exist. 
there's a big and interesting project, if you want to look at it, called the Missing Maps Project, which is in many places in the world, there are no maps in the worlds that exist. Um, and so not knowing where you're going to go, but it's safe, you know, that road is possible, uh, and at the other end, what you're going to find, whether it's going to be actually power or uh, people or others, uh, makes that last mile logistics extremely complex. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of people who have lived in the northern hemisphere have a hard time comprehending that because supply chain in the northern hemisphere is relatively smooth and easy. Unless you want to return goods to manufacturing, but that's fine. <coughs> Whoever wrote that question, if you want to ask a follow-up on it. Yeah, so I shortened the question. Yeah, <laughs> I made it a little long, sorry. Um, so I was wondering how your IT solutions kind of fit in amongst the supply chain of, let's say I'm an NGO and I'm coming to you for services. I didn't know if you were, as you said, helping them with the last mile or helping them with just the infrastructure for setting up um, you know, their services. I was just wondering kind of where you fit in along that supply chain. Yeah, so uh, I'm working with colleagues from uh, Oxfam and uh, in Lambda, uh, Royal and others, uh, on the frontline humanitarian logistics, which is at last hour of delivery. Uh, Believe it or not, it's 2020, and we are still using special computer to and there's absolutely no systems in the world that does that. So we're trying to set at least a data standard. The systems are less important than, than data standards to figure out how to move water, how to move bricks, how to move shovels, how to move blankets and others to the, the people in need. So, that, so that's really, really clear in terms of IT technology on top of that. Um, Meanwhile, when I talk to DHL, FedEx, or UPS, and others, they have a wonderful system. The systems are meant when, as I explained earlier, you have a library where say, you actually know the time it will take from your driver to go from the point A to point B and others. So the, the plan is to assure out the data model and then to give that data model to large software vendors, like Salesforce, Microsoft, or all and others, to then to implement the persistence. So it becomes a module that NGOs can purchase as opposed to something we have to build and maintain. That makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so your LinkedIn profile says, could technology be applied to solve some of the world's biggest problems, etc.? And could digital transformation be a path to closing the humanitarian gap sooner? <laughs> yeah, that's what the lawyers always tell you, just answer yes or no. <laughs> Problems. 
a problem of um, you know, gender treatment differences, a uh, problem of uh, inequities in the regions of the world, and others. Uh, so that, that's the uh, uh, that's the gist of it. Uh, on climate change, there's a lot to be done with technology uh, because we are, there's a lot of data and a lot of understanding of what causes um, climatic variations, but particularly, forget about the why of climate change. Think about it, how are you going to live with it? I mean, I'm already seeing here in New Zealand refugees from Kiribati. Kiribati is a small nation, probably never heard about it. Uh, their island is about a few, you know, a few feet high above the water. They're already flooded. Right? When you talk about a few centimeters of sea level rise, for them that means you know, an entire village that is beach, right? And then more later, you're gonna, you're gonna say, oh, well, yeah, when the conflict is finished, you will return to your home. Your home is water, sea water. So you're starting to see that. You're gonna start to see that your food is gonna be more expensive, certain foods won't disappear from your table. Some people may starve, and I've seen that already in parts of Africa. In the North Wing, at uh, New Zealand, uh, we are in the largest drought ever. We've had the last five years of regular heat, right? So, yeah, I like heat, but that way we can no longer grow food. Right? So, that's the adaptation of climate change that's going to be super important for your generation. How do you deal with the mess we've left here? Right? That's pretty much it. Um, on other aspects like refugees, it could be that people cross nations. So working with Vincent South Frontier on the issue of how do refugees maintain their health care between Syria and Sweden? Now they go across a bunch of countries, not that they're registered into the healthcare system of these countries, right? Um, and so how do we, if they have chronic things like asthma, diabetes, or if it's a kid that needs a bunch of vaccination along the way, how do we do that? Right? So the way validation issue of moving a, a patient across borders, national borders and others that have different healthcare systems and languages and names for them and others it is a critical one for which technology, in this case, some sort of a medical passport um, might help. Uh, in economic development, I am surprised every time I go to a low to mid income country that all the economic development programs are free are um, technologies that are of the third industry of revolution. We're trying to teach people how to solve how to become a great player, how to have a little dairy and a commerce, and extra. I'm not saying it's not important, but nobody is telling them how to read their phone. Nobody is telling them electronics, digital, and others. And yet, at the same time, I've seen that the people who are the most successful in the stores of these people, Beijing and others, are the ones who are on the top floor, where they are there about uh, all, uh, this uh, shop that's about the size of the guest that's in front of you, right? They make a business as fixing electronics, right? And in the same countries when I go to, say, Africa or Asia, I see tons of people with electronics that are perishing, right? That can be fixed by small little businesses at the core, right? But instead of that, we'd rather teach people how to repair a bicycle or, or, or that we get a little smartphone or a little phone, that people depend on at the same level that they depend on bicycles. So we're really digital in the skills, we're a digital economy is missing out of the economic development. We're leaving people seriously behind as a result. Um, and then we uh, have a question in the, uh, I think so, uh, other segments like, uh, I think I touched on healthcare, refugees, climate. Uh, food security is probably the hardest one, but um, we did some work when I was with the Nature Conservancy on uh, precision agriculture. Um, for example, you would be surprised to know that uh, Julio Bello, which is a relatively well-known uh, brand of cheap points you might consume on campus, is um, in California, sensing the amount of water that there is inside of the vine, and delivering exactly the right amount of water to that vine in order to mitigate the use of water and optimize the food production. So I wouldn't be surprised that in the future we have that precision agriculture going more and more. Um, in New Zealand, there's a company that uses a laser that finds out exactly how much fertilizer to give the grass in a uh, you know two inch by two inch type square to be able to grow that grass to optimal uh, rate. So that's where technology can be of help in terms of food. Okay.
Okay, let me, let me skip around here and say, uh, what, what about one of your most exciting aha moments when using design thinking at Neto, either your own or watching somebody else experience it? So, uh, watching somebody else expresses that the non-profit sector is pretty biased. We think that because the for-profit sector is really corrupt, we're not going to take anything. I have a great quote of a, uh, a leader of the non-profit sector that says, interesting idea, but it comes from a very bankrupt sector, and I would not take it. Right. That, that's that very strong bias. And so it's very interesting to see leaders of the nonprofit sector look at a real, real innovation that presents an innovation similar to what they wanted to do, but, but from a, 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 it's to look at it and say, oh, it's interesting, but for profit is innovative about the same way that I want to innovate. So finding commonality between the for profit and the for profit is very interesting. The really biggest how moment was um, to see CEOs of nonprofits drop their guard and a mask and all that, you know, all around them, and then those will become humans and work together with their colleagues at all levels. So I've seen CEOs work with, you know, refugees and other people who cross the chain of hierarchy and others. So that collapse of hierarchical barriers of the organization was amazing to watch, where, you know, they, they would give the pen to somebody to write a post it, for example, as if they were, you know, an assistant and others, and there was no, no awkward moment about that. So we're collaborating towards the same why. So we get into that why that I spoke to at the beginning. Why is powerful, right? If you can break hierarchical barriers and see CEOs working with all members of the organization on the same why as equal, not as you know, hierarchical titled people, that's good in point. So how do you keep up with all this new and changing technology? Um, what do you do to stay on top of the biggest advancements? And how do you keep your technology skills current? You're not in school anymore. <laughs> how do you keep your tech skills current? Yes, uh, uh, <laughs> the answer is use it. Because <laughs> otherwise, it's not relevant. And the problem is that uh, you can read about it in posh journals like uh, Fortune Magazine, Wall Street Journal, stuff like that. That's what baby boomers do. They still read the stuff. It's for the newspaper. It's made out of paper and it's using it for Somebody else has tried to read it. They actually recycle the news. Um, so that's not the way to do it. The way to do it is what you are all doing in this class and what your peers are doing, which is discover something you do, share it with peer, try to play with it, use it if it's useful, and then it is not, right? So I do everything, let me give you an example. Uh, the, um, this thing a few years ago, this a little bit longer now, um, this thing with blockchain came up on my radar, so that's very interesting. So, um, so I programmed my own blockchain to figure out how this stuff would work. So I wrote a blockchain, it's not that difficult, surprisingly. And then that one non commercial, which was in like zillions of dollars and make me a unicorn company. I just wanted to understand how does this stuff work? What is that? Right? So I wrote one. It's not that complicated, it's interesting. I would better understand the blockchain as a result. But the person was just the, read the McKinsey article on blockchain for executives, which is totally useless. I'm not really. Um, and so using technology, programming with it, when I code, not that much that you become a programmer, but after you get to test the stuff, you know, tinker with things and others, play with it. Um, it's the same thing that, uh, and some of you may, uh, may remember that from your childhood when uh, at the dinner table, uh, one of your, uh, whoever who raised you, right, uh, said to you, uh, Try that. Just give it a five. Try it. Experience it, right? And you discover you know, it was young, it was good. And then now you're using it as in your stable, or you're not. You're really that food. Right? So it's the same thing with technology. Play with it, use it. You know, um, most of it is software and cloud based. It's cheap to do. Most of it is premium nowadays, so you can get the license for free and play with it. So that's what I do. Okay. But I do that a lot, surprisingly. Uh, more so than I will actually work. <coughs> I used to produce something. So it's in the past that used to rely on some very big pundit like Ed to have written a research paper about it and it was good enough. That's different. 
All right, so let, let me end on this question and then I'll open it up for any other questions from the floor. But if you had one piece of advice to somebody just starting out, what would it be? sector. So if somebody graduated from uh, with a degree in computer science or some technical uh, degree, uh, what could an NGO do to persuade those individuals to work uh, for a nonprofit compared to, say, Google or Microsoft? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, any talent are being pushed out of the nonprofit sector because the for-profit to for-profit pushing has switch limits. Another. So how do you compete with talent? Um, there, there are two ways you compete with talent. One is a kind of a really weird way, which is which I got learned from a, a graduate from Stanford University who became a billionaire, and he said, I had two paths. Work for an NGO, or put my idea to, to bed, create a new startup company, sell it, be public, make a lot of money, and then give my money to an NGO. More so than I would contribute myself. So, so please, Think of taking that path as one uh, to have those bad ideas and others. The other one's maybe the why. I mean, NGOs have a, a stronger why of the existence, why you work in the organization, than for profit companies. And well, for profit companies are trying to get there. Think about uh, study, for example, the changes in the mission of uh, large nonprofits in the last decade or others. Uh, a good one is Microsoft to look at. Uh, nonprofits are trying to, for profits are trying to give their employees uh, a reason to work for them. Um, 
the last day that I pray, uh, actually I'm working on something, so for that is I did four prophets, the tenure of an employee who was a millennial is about 13 months. So think about it. The employee's chance. And then they moved to another company and so we have no respect to the company. In the NGO sector, it's about five years. So they're looking at the NGO sector and say, how can I retain people longer? And it's a sense of purpose of the organization, a sense of mission, a sense of worth for the individuals and others. So uh, my profits have already that. I think from an IT perspective is get rid of the baby boomer in the NGO and actually have people who get the digital world. Because the people who are coming and graduating today, they get it. And when they can't have an intelligent conversation about data, artificial intelligence, bias in data and others of this year, then that's demoralizing. Because they got hired with all that talent and they used to maybe five percent of it and so they just bad in their eye. Right? It's not it's a joke, but, uh, but uh, you know, it's not really fulfilling in that. So it, it, it's a it's a serious issue, the lack of comprehension of the digital world. And and that's how they would compete for talent by by essentially making it A matter and B understanding what what's happening with blockchain age with AI is and others and how you can use it and having those discussions with this tech talent. Okay, well, thank you, J.L. What's the, just, just for a sake, just for a sake of... I have a question. You're going to ask a question, okay. Let's see the question. You used to have to Facebook. Facebook had habituated of doing this or that, right? Yeah. And I will ask you, how do you see the future of humanity? So it's way to thumb up, it's going to be great, that's going to be something like, I don't know. The future. The future of humanity. He's asking for a vote. <laughs> future humanity up, even that. my best to Emma and the kids and uh, hope to see you soon. Bye. Take care. Coming in, please answer the three questions on the index card. No names. come on up and we'll jump into your section. Um, just everybody please just note what the three questions are. So similar to the index survey we did last week, I'll tell you the results near the end of the class. What did you like? What didn't you like that you want to know more about? And then this is a different question, this last one. One to five, how effective was this actually interview? This case was not a presentation. Stand or sit, whichever you prefer. Oh, well, <clears throat> I guess I'll stand for now. Okay, so we had um, four different readings this week. Um, the order that I put them in is kind of how I felt like they went together. So the first two kind of overlapped um, between the hype cycle and the innovation waves. Um, and then the dismantling the iceberg and the Venus project kind of went the way I saw it kind of went together as well. So. For the first reading, the Gardner Heights cycle, 
Um, this is um, a methodology that gives you a view of how technology or an application will evolve over time, and it provides a sound source of insight to manage its deployment within the context of your specific business goals. Um, so it has these five key phrases, which I know I only have a little <laughs> version up there, but you guys have seen it um, in your readings. But you have the, basically, I can point with this screen. Yep, okay. So the innovation trigger, the idea that's put out there into the world. Um, the peak of um, inflated expectations, which is where it's kind of building over time. The trough of disillusionment slope of en enlightenment and plateau of productivity. Although not all innovations will make it all the way through this cycle. These cycles can help you gauge risk and decide whether to be an early adopter or wait for maturation. Um, and so that kind of reminded me of um, the innovation or the, um, yeah, the innovation diffusion curve that we talked about last week. We talked about early adopters, um, I don't know, mid adopters and then laggers. And so kind of deciding using these two, using this tool can kind of help you gauge whether you would want to be an early adopter of um, a particular innovation for your company. <coughs> um, so when I was reading it, these are some of the questions that I was just thinking about or didn't know the answer to. <coughs> So for the second reader, the second reading, um, Manager's Guide to the IT Innovation Waves. Um, this is kind of just a different idea of the same concept. So you have more of an S curve of a, um, the wave of innovation. Um, they talked about how innovation ideas and concepts are spread similar to like infectious diseases. So one individual transmits an idea to another, and then you have an increase of exposure and incidence. Um, until it is run like its natural course or re reached its like natural limits. Um, <clears throat> it also has five different phases, which are somewhat similar to the height curve, but a little bit different. Um, <clears throat> for breaking the surface is the beginning of the idea, much like the height curve. Um, sending out ripples is when um, the examples that they gave were maybe reaching out to research and analyst <clears throat> analytic companies um, and possibly getting a white paper published about what your innovation or idea is. Causing a squawk would be um, um, continuing to promote the idea and innovation at different conferences, symposiums. Um, building the swell is actually getting businesses to buy into your innovation and ideas. Um, and then riding the crest would be basically taking advantage of um, the networks that you've built <clears throat> um, in the writing the crest section, they do emphasize the fact of not forgetting about implementation. Implementation can be the key to success to your, to your projects, not just selling it, but actually getting people to use it and use it properly. So these are my questions um, that I was thinking about for this reading. And so then switching gears, um, the next two readings are more geared towards um, strategy. Um, chapter three of Be the Business is about dismantling the iceberg. Um, she starts off by talking about how every CIO has an iceberg. Um, the tip of the iceberg are the flashy things that everybody thinks about that they want from their IT department. And below the water is possibly an aging or insecure infrastructure that nobody really <coughs> wants to think about. <coughs> Um, and she emphasizes the importance of giving budget and attention to the under the water problems um, that you might have. In order to dismantle the iceberg, um, she gave some suggestions of creating space. So thinking of ideas, I thought of it kind of as buying time, thinking of things that could quickly fix a problem. They're not the, the actual solution to changing the root of the under the water problems, but they'll buy you time, create space um, to give you 
um, time to think about and um, strategize how you're going to fix the root of the problem. Um, and then breaking down large applications can help to tackle the base of the iceberg. So if you have a large application that seems very daunting to take on, to break that up into different chunks and have people work on small sections of it at a time. Um, and then she also talked about CIOs needing to have a significant and deep understanding of te technology architecture. So not losing those skills that got you to the place that you are, but being truly understanding the work that your teams are doing. Um, and then lastly, she the, the main takeaway that I took from it is that a lot of times CIOs are standing in their own way. And so you can begin to dismantle it when you stop protecting the iceberg and rethinking, um, doing the hard work of rethinking what the architecture should be. Um, and changing your criteria when you're selecting outsourcers, thinking about outsourcing <coughs> in a way that can help you with your long-term goals and not maybe the cheapest, quickest um, solution to a problem. <coughs> so these were my questions for this reading. Okay, and for the last reading, the Phoenix Project, um, it was five chapters, it was a pretty interesting um, section of events. It's, it's a very, like you've mentioned before, it's a very fast paced, <laughs> things are happening every day that uh, would seem kind of crazy in real life, but we, are, we open um, in chapter five with um, an emergent email that Bill has to tend to about an audit um, that has like, 179 lines, or no, it was 175 pages um, filled with lines of problems of things that he needed to solve. Um, moves on to um, ch in chapter seven, he meets Eric, who is kind of serving as a mentor role to him, and Eric takes him and shows him around um, one of the factory plants. And I picked this one quote because it seemed to kind of he was defining for Bill um, what he feels like Bill's role as the VP of IT should be. Um, as we move on to chapters 8 through 10, Bill is really spending a lot of time trying to streamline the efficiency. They have all these projects um, that people are working on, but not any real organization to them, no timeline, no sense of who's doing what when. So, he was really trying to work on that. He, he seemed to realize that he needed more help, and he asked the CEO for more help, which was abruptly turned down. Um, and so he moved on to other solutions with actually index cards <laughs> that everyone um, would break on their projects, and that's how he um, was starting to streamline the process. And so these are just some of the questions I had when reading those chapters. Um, so out of all of the questions that I came up with, I do have um, three class discussion questions that I picked out um, that you guys can participate in. Okay, so going back to the hype cycles, um, one of my questions was, do all innovations follow this cycle? Would it be beneficial for an innovation to break the cycle? I don't actually know the answer. So. <laughs> Could you go backwards in the slide sure. to where that question is, just yeah. so we can sort of see it again? It's the second question. The second, yeah. <laughs> Aaron. I think the goal is to minimize the traffic disillusionment. So, like, kind of forecasting what's going to happen before you get there so that you can. If not avoid the trough altogether, then make it less deep. Yeah, that's what I kind of thought to do. Yeah. Well, and I wonder how much the low is caused by all of the expectation that's set at the you know, start of things. And so if you could maybe level that out as well. 
make it not so high. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you notice it's called a hype. hype. So, <laughs> and so what do organizations, technology companies in particular, what do they tend to do with their new technologies? It's great. It's great to pump it up, right? Oversell it, right? And so in the sales cycle, you do have those unrealistic expectations bubble up. And then when when it doesn't meet that vision, then people go, oh, or problems start to occur that people experience and write about, whatever, and then you, boom, you've got that crash. Yeah. So perhaps the goal, one goal would be, you know, can you flatten that? Which means it being less, less height, <laughs> less, less, height, less, trough. less yeah. trough, right? Yeah. And when we're talking about like internal technology, at least this is from my personal observation, <clears throat> like I think that it's the people who are trying to like push something onto a greater organization that are causing the inflated expectations. And then when not everyone like buys into the idea, maybe it's like a lack of training, a lack of understanding of its importance, or it actually just isn't as good as it was meant to be. Maybe it's like the wrong application for a problem. If that's what causes the trauma of dissolution, so I think that like also having more people um, involved in like the development process, the implementation, and making sure that your like internal internal customers are appropriately served during the, the inflation expectation period will help you have less of a rough um, downside. Yeah. So thinking about the other the other IT wave really emphasizing implementation. Has so, so getting stakeholder buy-in or audience buy-in, even for internal projects, as you're mentioning, is an important part of project management that we will come back to. So that's an important part. They put out about 100 of these through different um, different domains every year. Have anybody any, looked at them? They're, yeah. they're actually not. I thought they would be more like things, but they're ideas more so. Are they all ideas? Um, no, I mean, you would see, for example, uh, supply chain management systems as, okay. as one hype cycle. Uh, customer relationship management system, you know, the, you know, the sales type systems. Um, yeah, I guess I thought it would be like yeah. a particular sales system, not uh, like the idea of The it. category, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll show you a chart a little bit later on that has some of the particular emerging technologies, as that is more specific. <coughs> But you're right, there are lots of these. <clears throat> and companies actually pay Gartner a fee for being able to show this hype cycle where, it, where they're, or what they call the magic quadrant, where those in the upper right quadrant are the ones that are the, 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 you know, the, the companies that are on the leading edge and have the most potential. And if they end up in, their, in the Gartner analysis being one of those featured ones, they'll pay a fee to include that document on their website so you can download it. It's then used as a sales uh, item. But that's a, uh, you know, one could ask the question if that's a conflict of interest, you know, to, to do an independent analysis, but then you're selling it too. Uh, okay, for my second question was from Be The Business. Um, how do you prevent icebergs from forming? <laughs> and how frequently should so like, if, if there is some magic to preventing them, what is it? Do not form an organization. That's that's an optimistic thing. <laughs> <laughs> what would JL say? What would JL say about that? What happens when water moves rapidly? It doesn't freeze. <laughs> so he might say, move faster. Because we'll always, always be upgrading. Yeah. Or the other part of what he was saying is do smaller things, smaller pieces. Yeah. And maybe that they're less likely to become icebergs. But it, dealing with the iceberg is not something that investors are particularly interested in. This is. 
below the waterline, running the business as usual, um, and particularly in the nonprofit world, what donors want to fund dealing with iceberg problems? Just that and then is. what happens over time is you build up what's called technical debt, but we'll talk about technical debt in the subsequent class. <clears throat> okay, and then my last question was from the Phoenix Project, um, and it's the first one. What was Bill's ask for more staff the right move at the right time, or did he not fully tackle the problem? Not that I'm leading with that question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I guess, like, if realistically, it sounds like it's probably the right move because it sounds like they're not streamlined efficiently, and maybe not having full-time staff to be contractors come in was probably the better move to ask for because there's clearly a lot of like streamlining in their workflow that they definitely needed to do. Um, so I think like everyone's kind of like hitting the panic mode. Like the CEO is pushing back, but I think that there could have been more bargaining there because like the CEO is right, he's not really in a position to be asking for anything when a lot of the issues that they're coming up with are their own doing. But at the same time, if they really have to hit these benchmarks, like these timelines because it's like do or die, then something needs to give. And they're not gonna be able to just solve it by like cleaning up the workflow and getting things. Have you, have you heard the phrase of, it's maybe an American colloquialism, but I think it's used in other countries too, don't throw good money after bad. And essentially what that means is don't invest in things that are in trouble. Um, and is Phoenix a, a project that's in trouble? Is the IT department in trouble in the book? Yeah. So the CEO is kind of reluctant to put more money in there. Uh, you're right, who, who said that mentioned consultants? You know, Dylan, you mentioned consultants. <coughs> the advantage of consultants is what? Okay. Cost-wise, what's the advantage of consultants? Cost. Cheaper, but also like temporary. They go away, <laughs> <laughs> right? They have an end date. So when you're asking for consultant help, you're not asking for somebody to be added to the payroll that then is gonna go on unless there's a, they're fired or there's a layoff. You're asking for somebody to come and help that has a beginning and an end. That may be an easier ask. Uh, it's questionable whether they're cheaper. It <laughs> depends on from where you're, <laughs> you're asking for consulting help. Yeah. Um, if Bill knows what he knows now, would he go in and ask for more money? You mean by the end of chapter 10? If he had, yeah, what are we on now in the book? So all of this has happened through chapter 10. If in chapter 11 he were to go back and ask for more money um, based on what he knows now, how likely is he to do that? Probably less likely. Yeah. Because it's, you mean because he's learned more about like how people are functioning? Yeah. And how the senior management is viewing costs. Yeah. Yeah. Is being, you know, the CFO, we've met the CFO, I believe, and the question is, you know, is Venus going to save us money? Is it going to help us make more money? And those are two parts of the, the finance question um, that end up becoming pretty important. Um, what do you think of Eric so far? A little quirky. <laughs> like yoga. Yeah, that's why I, that's why they used the picture of him. Yeah, right. He's he's sort of the you know the. The guru that appears on the scene disappears for a while, comes back again. So in the story of the book, he comes back from time to time. And so Bill learns some new things. And I'll, I'll talk about it in a slide here, but these you know, the four ways uh, they end up becoming a pretty important part of applying a manufacturing concept to the IT department. It's called lean management. Did you ask one of those questions? Yeah, that's about, right. Okay, well, thank you so much. We start. So um, I went back to the. Um, is anybody here taking Michael Hess's class on agility? 
Okay, so you know he's chosen the, the, the Phoenix book. So he came to talk about the Phoenix book, and so I said, well, I've got a timeline of the Phoenix book, but I have to clean it up. So this is the cleaned up version. Uh, I said that he's doing something different with the book than we're doing, so um, I won't comment on, on where he's going, but um, uh, it's, it's, I think it's interesting that he's applying it to, uh, to Agile methodologies. Um, so we're through chapter 10, which is along that, that whole top bar, um, and next time we'll finish part one, um, and a pretty important turn in the story of the book that, uh, that we'll read about. Um, are people finding it's pretty much a fast read? You know, this, this is not, it's not making a big demand on you, right? It's, it's, uh, it's what's gonna happen next more of a, of a, of a novel. Yeah, Marina. The thing that I found interesting was like the way the different departments talk to each other in the meeting. Yeah. I don't know, they just like, they're not like really professional and they aren't really respectful. We're just like weren't. <laughs> yeah, they're just like, so like, I'm wondering like if that's like actually how they talk to each other? Is it he like <laughs> writing it in a way to like make it more extreme? It depends on the organization. What you'll find is, so what tone does the CEO set? And so, you know, the CEO, Steve, is not really setting an example here of collaboration, <coughs> valuing people's input, uh, listening well. Um, and so are others doing that? And, and uh, you know, there, you have some that are, uh, that are becoming just outright ambition above all this, right? Um, you know, Sarah wants to be the next CEO. Um, and you know she'll stop at, at nothing and views the IT department as a, as a great way that she can, you know, sort of appear higher by making them appear lower. Right? And so that bit of politics is not uncommon, unfortunately. I wish I could say that you know organizations don't work that way, um, but they do. And each organization has its own bit of dysfunction, just like every family has its own bit of dysfunction, right? <laughs> Um, but how the tone is set at the top makes a difference. If the CEO says, we're not, I'm not gonna tolerate that, if he stands up on me because two, two members of the management team are, are at each other's throats and arguing with each other, you know, he says, look, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna tolerate this type of discussion. You both go off in a room, figure it out and come back, and when you're ready to talk constructively about it, then we can talk about it with the whole team. That sets a different tone. The expectation is we're going to be civil. Right? Not always easy to pull off. Okay, um, the four types of work. So we've heard about three now. And so we started to do the index card. We're sorting the index card. You know, Patty's got this uh, this thing going, and I can almost visualize what that room looks like. You know, with the, <coughs> with the cards taped up on the wall. Um, business projects, internal projects, change projects, and we'll find out in chapter 15, what the fourth type of work are. Those four types of IT work end up being rather important uh, in the book and in, in the ultimately how uh, Bill Palmer solves uh, some of his problems. So pay attention for and look for that when it comes. <clears throat> now I mentioned I was gonna talk about hype cycles and, and real examples. So Gartner does an emerging tech hype cycle each year. And this was 2018. And you know, here's you know, autonomous. Somebody asked a question about autonomous driving, uh, you know, vehicles, and there are um, there are actually five levels of autonomous. Right, it gets more and more autonomous. This is level four, um, which is sort of you know on its way to the trough of disillusionment, probably you know getting pushed by the uh, the Uber incident, augmented reality. They're arguing is sort of bottoming out there. Here's 5G sort of coming along, and then autonomous mobile robots, I, I happen to tag there. Um, and the triangles are something that's really not gonna come into the plateau for more than 10 years. And you can see the other, the other expectations uh, for the other ones. Now, if you compare this, and these are the five trends that they said under which you know, these things are happening. Um, these are sort of big ticket items that I, I can firm like a Gartner research firm is always interested in, in how can they 
rephrase this every year and grab headlines in the IT journals and press, right? So this is their way, you know, do-it-yourself biohacking. <laughs> I'd love to have been in the meeting where they came up with that one. I understand immersive experiences, I understand ubiquitous infrastructure because one could call that cloud. Um, you know, they're thinking a little bit broader perhaps than there. <coughs> but here's this question that um, Emily was, was touching on from the readings is, you know, where's the adoption risk the greatest? So if you have, you running, managing an IT department and you are adopting new emerging technologies, where would you least want to adopt it? Where on the curve? Mary Grace. Um, you know, I was going to say, let me just mess with you before. I was going to say adopting technology that's core to the function of your business, like if you're trying to transform that piece of it, but that's my idea what you're asking. Yeah, so that would, yeah, that would be about uh, what your decision filters might be, you know, and types of technology. So, I would guess peak of, peak of inflated expectations, because that's where you might lose the most. If you adopt a new technology in your organization up here, what are you asking for? To be really viewed as having made a bad choice, <laughs> right? And if you're a nonprofit organization, do you want to be investing here? Or do you want to be investing as you see it coming out of the, the trough? Um, if you wait until here, you're going to be a laggard, right? That's waiting too long. So the question is, is your organization a pioneer? Or is it going to be more of a fast follower? Now, Microsoft is the classic fast follower. Who did the browser first? <coughs> yeah, that's good. Mozilla, the Mozilla browser came first, and then Microsoft, you know, built it into the operating system, and, and you know, and, and made a few improvements, but basically it invested a lot more money in it, and they zoomed up fast behind it. But they weren't the pioneer in that space. There are a number of other examples as well, but that's that's one of the classic ones. Now, here's what it looks like as of last year, <coughs> and. There's autonomous driving vehicles level four. It's moved further down to the trough. Um, 5G, we're, I mean, you hear 5, 5G everywhere you go in the world now, um, up at the peak. Um, but what happened to blockchain and mobile robots? You know, they're, they're sort of missing from this list. I, haven't, I, dug, I read the article and then I tried you know, digging further in to find out why did they drop those? Um, but, or do they consider them less emerging and you know, has it moved off this way? I don't think so. Um, I do see mobile robots being tested on the streets of Ann Arbor. If you've seen the little units going around with the person following on the bicycle, have you seen this? Yeah, yeah. look for it. It's really it's fun to see. Yeah. Where do you think regulations come into play? Ah, yeah, regulation has an important role. So, um, you know, if you, you look at uh, Facebook as a good example. You have this unbridled growth and this huge expansion of user base. And then all of this concern, government concern in, in the EU and elsewhere about privacy regulations and the compliance um, things that are hitting Facebook now are weighing it down. It's harder to grow fast when you have more compliance regulations put on top of you. Um, it's going to be interesting. I think the next couple of years will be very interesting as to what happens with the, with the top tech companies. <coughs> the five trends, remember I said that they, they have to uh, invent new words so that they have uh, better articles to publish. Uh, they've all changed except digital ecosystems. That was the only one that stayed, stayed the same from the previous. All the rest of these are, are new. Uh, the augmented human, maybe that's, uh, maybe that's why there's not augmented reality because it just sort of changed domain totally. Um, and it's not on the list anymore. Um, and most of these things now are five to 10 years out instead of being 10 or more. So there is an acceleration in terms of the outlook of what's happening. But this is for an IT manager, particularly a CIO, it's important to check in with what's happening on emerging technologies and asking the questions, what new things am I going to be investing in above the waterline at the top of the iceberg? from among this list. 
what might have impact on my business, what am I willing to experiment, which of these experiments might have the least negative impact if it goes south. So choosing among these, because the, uh, a recipe for disaster, if you're a senior IT manager, is to try to do them all. I'll bet you if you try to do them all, you're not paying attention to the iceberg. And that'll come back to bite you in the sense of sinking the Titanic you know, at, some, at some point. So um, let's just shift. Any questions about that before I go into innovation? So um, what's happening this week? What big conference is happening this week in the world, on the world stage? Davos. Davos. 21st to the 24th. In Davos, Clay Christensen, professor at Harvard, father of disruptive innovation, gave a interview and talked about three types of innovation. There's what he calls a disruptive innovation, which is the one that uh, most people have heard about, um, which is that, you know, these, you know, it's sort of these new products that sneak in at the uh, lower quality, lower cost, and start to chip away at the at the whoever the dominant uh, player is in the market, and it wreaks havoc, as he said, uh, with industries. They're sustaining innovation. So, um, well, here's an example. Here would be the the Ford Model T car was a disruptive technology. What did it disrupt? Horse and carriage. Horse, <laughs> horse and carriage, right? Exactly. <laughs> Um, people were writing in the New York Times and other papers were writing about how um, this car that backfired was scaring the horses. This has got to be a bad thing. <laughs> right. um, sustaining innovation, so it replaces old models with new products and, and bunches of new features. And so Toyota Prius may be an example there where it may, you know, that may unseat the Camry, for example, as, as another Toyota product. And then there's efficiency innovations, which is to make existing products uh, run more proficiently. Lean production. So this, this, this term lean is what's happening in Phoenix. It's applying lean methodologies to the IT department. And Christensen has something very interesting to say. He says, only the disruptive ones creates new jobs. The other two tend to either replace existing jobs uh, or, or, in this case of efficiency, loses jobs. Um, but creating whole new categories uh, can create new jobs. And then beware of that false comfort of incrementalism. Some companies say, we're being innovative because we are taking our Phoenix systems and other systems and making them more efficient. Is that, in, is that innovation in the sh strong sense of the word? Um, or is that incrementalism? Ben? Wouldn't the amount of, of something being adopted have a lot, a lot to do with the, the, job, the amount of job creation? So like, yeah. probably the, the amount of workers building cars at the peak of the 1970s or even before automation took over had to be more than the people making carriages and shooting horses. And making what? What was the last one? Like the people who make horse and carriages. Yeah, yeah. There mm -hmm. had to be more people making and fixing cars than there are people making and fixing horses. Yeah, I mean, there ended up being, you know, innovating on the assembly line, which was Henry Ford's big innovation, of breaking down the work into smaller and smaller chunks that could be done along an assembly line. And then the whole other economy that grew up around that new car car repairs, yeah. tires. Even, even automobile travel maps, you know, all of these things took off around. As something that's more and more of a university job. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, and so I mean, another way of saying that is where is it more likely to have high growth? You know, high growth is in revenue and in customers is probably happening more up here. And so that then gives the opportunity to hire more people to keep up with the growth. One of the numbers we used to manage to when I worked for a startup organization was uh, what is the average <coughs> revenue per employee? And at that time, it was a quarter of a million dollars. And so we said, let's not hire people faster than that ratio. 
So if we add another 100,000 of revenue per employee, we could add another employer too, but try to keep manage that ratio close to the 250,000 uh, per employee. That was just a rule of thumb we were doing at that time. Uh, it would be different now and it would be depending on what industry uh, you were in. But asking that most startup organizations, one of the key failure reasons is too rapid a growth. It happens again and again. It might be, um, uh, what was the one, was Boston Chicken, I think that's the classic example, where they added so many storefronts, um, they couldn't keep up the expense, outpaced the revenue, and they failed. Who did? The most recent example of that case was the WeWork company. Which, which? WeWork. WeWork, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, hype cycle, in this, in Gartner's case, hype cycle is being applied to technology, but it can be applied to organizations as well. How much hype existed about, about WeWork? Um, and did their costs get out ahead? Um, you know, the, the interesting, the classical cases, if you look at Amazon, Amazon did not make a profit for, I think, the first 15 years, 10 years of its existence. And Bezos argued that it's positive, it's, it's cash flow, that's the most of free cash flow, I think is what he called it. That that was more important to watch was free, was free cash flow growing. And he had a way of de defining that, even though they didn't turn a profit for, for many years. Um, so he was managing growth, but not the traditional understanding of growth, which is in, in profit. So the IT manager needs to worry about this, because part of this is, is the IT services that I'm going to be providing in my company, is it going to keep pace with the growth forecast? Because if it takes long to grow and build on your IT infrastructure and your IT systems and applications, you don't want to be behind. And the last thing you want to do is be the reason for growth slowing. This is what's happening in the Phoenix project, right? The Phoenix system is being viewed as slowing down the growth relative to the competitors. Rochelle, you had a question. I was just going to ask about efficiency, innovation. When do you think, or where do you think the line is drawn to consider something a true example of efficiency, innovation versus like a profit-making mechanism? So like when you have like an iPhone and you have different versions over time, and I think I'm going to make the claim that like between earlier versions of the subsequent updated version, you do see significant shift and difference in what the product actually is. But sometimes between one version and the next, it's very minimal. And so where do you draw the line between saying like, yes, it was right. actually innovative and like, you know, this is the iPhone is more efficient in this way versus like, they just want to sell a new product. So what happens with each version of the iPhone It's harder with each version to, to be innovative. What's, what's the latest feature that's being promoted with the iPhone? Three cameras. <laughs> the three, well, yeah, but what, what can you do with three cameras? What's, what's the, what are all the commercials focused on now? Slow-mo selfies. Slow-mo selfies. <laughs> yeah. They've got the, in all of the, the NFL playoff games, they were showing this ad again and again, you know, and, and I'm thinking, how in the world are they keeping their iPhone dry because they're out doing flips and, you know, and snowboarding. Uh, and taking a slow motion selfie. Um, that is more possible with the, the power of the latest iPhone and the, and the three cameras allow you to, to do some of the little things as well. So um, that's, they're saying, that's the feature. That's why you want to get the next edition. You want to get this new feature, right? Uh, when they first came out with two cameras, it was you can get more depth photos <coughs> You can do some things that fancy cameras do, like you can fuzz out the background and sharpen the foreground and things like that. Um, but it becomes harder. It really becomes harder, particularly for the incumbent, what I call the incumbent organization, the established one who has the lead. It becomes harder and harder for them to innovate and have new products. So um, Ben brought up the issue, of the, the example rather, the metaphor of the moonshot. And John F. Kennedy saying we're going to land uh, somebody on the moon in 10 years. Uh, we did it uh, about six months early, I think, um, in, in the summer of 1969, um, where um, every school kid, and I was a school kid then, was glued to the television. We all watched 
that first step, that first landing is absolutely amazing. And so that this has become a metaphor. There's a book out now that I had to, after Ben mentioned this, and I said, oh, ah, yeah, 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 that's a concept. I remember, you know, remember this. And there's a new book, a business book out called The Moonshot Effect. And there are organizations like Google and others that talk about their moonshot project or their moonshot de department you know, that's focused on these things. Um, and so the question is related to the innovation question, but the question is, is Phoenix a moonshot project? So that, yeah, that, that was my first thought. Yeah, probably, that it's certainly a bet the business, <laughs> you know, project. But here's the definitions that the two authors of, the, of this uh, book uh, mentioned. One is a uh, senior consultant and the other is a CEO. Um, and uh, they have both said that um, it's a worthy objective, hard to achieve because it requires significant <coughs> scientific or technological breakthroughs. Certainly going to the moon requires significant technological breakthroughs. Um, and the pivotal event they mentioned in the book was the fact that we happen to have a rocket engine in the U.S. that was powerful enough to break the Earth orbit, and the Soviets did not. And so Kennedy picked up on that as an as a, as a opportunity. Let's go for that moonshot. Um, it demands organizations and teams change how they operate. We're seeing that in Phoenix. They're having to change the way they operate. And it operates at a compressed time frame. Well, you know, that's Phoenix on steroids. I mean, this whole thing has happened in 19 weeks, which is unrealistic. But it's, you know, the, the meeting with the CEO um, is, uh, you know, he said, what is his demand? We're going to launch this two weeks. And, you know, the IT people are having a heart attack. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a train wreck that's about to happen. Um, uh, so the, uh, uh, I'm enjoying the book uh, by, by these, uh, these two women executives that have written it. Um, and which of these has Phoenix have? And probably, as I said, probably those last two. But it's not really technologically, it's not really doing anything special. Or, or new for that matter. Um, as a matter of fact, they're, they're trying to take a typical sedan car and make it run. <laughs> and that's the problem they're having. They're having an integration problem and had, you know, delivering that, that car to the, to the market. But it really isn't. There are no technology breakthroughs. I would add to this, though, is it a bet the business project? Um, the moonshot in, uh, in the Kennedy era was definitely a, a bet the country uh, type uh, exercise and the billions of dollars that were then poured into that project uh, was because you know everybody lined up behind it and said we got to do this. Uh, so it really was a, a you know bet the company. Certainly, is Phoenix a bet the business project? Yeah. It's you know it's, they're saying if we don't do Phoenix, we're going to fail as an organization. It's a must do. It's betting <coughs> betting the business. Um, but. It's rather traditional on the technology side, so that's the one part that's different. Okay, now all of that was to lead up to um, this figuring out what you need to do to get there, which is the second part of strategic alignment. This is a, this is a little bit shorter uh, unit, and I'll try to tie it together to things that uh, JL said um, and that we've, uh, that we've already talked about. Um, so the key question is, Given the internal and external environmental scans that we've done with SWAT, um, what makes a good IT strategy, and how do we take the next step you know, towards it? So we've analyzed the context. We've all done the, the, the SWAT uh, assignment um, and thought about what, is it, what does it take to clarify the context of a business? OK, great. Now. How do we decide uh, what next steps to take? So um, this getting to why is, uh, we've seen this in the pyramid diagram um, in terms of missions, values, objectives, and tasks. Um, if setting the ultimate goal is the mission or the why, uh, JL talked a lot about values and principles, about how you, know, how you were going to operate as an organization. The objectives are what tends to touch most of us in our departments, and then certainly the individual tasks that we have to do, or the departments have to do within that. 
Um, it's real important, I think, for no matter where you are on this issue, is to understand how you relate to this connection between levels. <laughs> and this is the what we're going to do it, you know, how and why, and uh, why and how and why. At the top, that strategy is that top part, and operations is the bottom, which is then the next unit that we'll deal with. Um, how much of Phoenix is an operations problem versus a strategy problem? It's more like a, a operational problem because they've had this for like two years now and now right. it's suddenly like getting across everyone's radar, which is like right. the company that's confusing. Exactly. It's an, I mean, it, it, have you discerned at all an IT strategy beyond launch Phoenix? I mean, don't they, in a typical project, you set milestones and then you... Right. <laughs> right. It's a project. <laughs> it happens to be the biggest project uh, that they're working on. Uh, and how do they make that happen in amongst all the other projects, like the projects needed to solve those audit problems that Emily pointed to in the book. Um, but they're probably not operating at, at, at the top. Even at Steve, Steve's level, the CEO, is he talking about... Vision and strategy? Or is he talking about problem solving? It's more problem solving. Now that may buy in, in, in may, that may buy short term advantages, especially with the uh, uh, with the stock market analysts who are viewing their company. Um, but ultimately uh, you're going to derail as an organization if, as, as JL was, I think, saying very strongly, if you don't know what your why is. <coughs> and so part of what we're doing is efficiency and processes, you know, are about making tasks, uh, tasks and objectives more, and then uh, meaning and strategy is more on, on the top side. So um, I mentioned that when I showed you the, the IT strategy at the International Red Cross, I mentioned that it was connected to the house diagram in the IT strategy. So in strategy 2020, and so the International Red Cross Red Crescent has just adopted strategy 2030. So this one is now a moot point. But uh, for historical reasons, I wanted to show you that this was the summary diagram of the three strategic aims and the three enabling actions that were driving the organization over a 10-year period um, and with a vision statement on the top. And here, building strong national societies, these are the country organizations, was, a, was viewed as foundational to running the International Red Cross and that having an efficient secretariat, which is the headquarters in Geneva, uh, was a, an enabler. Those were the two places where IT connected. So asking that question about where does your IT strategy connect, if you look at the organization strategy, is you're picking out points where the work you're doing in IT or want to do or plan to do in IT, where do those best connect? And then being able to say to senior management, the reason why you need to approve our budget for the next year, the reason why you need to invest in IT, is that if we don't grow these two things, you're gonna lose a key part of the foundation of your strategic plan going forward. So what we're working on is strategically important, not just a nice to have and not just the things that the IT department wants to do. Making that tie to the organization strategy ends up being rather important. So this, again, was the chart I showed last week <coughs> about these I, having these IT pillars. Which these are all typical IT types of things. Standards, architecture, you know, customer support, security, project management, and so on. These were the pillars in that diagram that then drove these goals with people on the IT side and then connected to those organizational um, strategic goals that were on the previous slide. And then we developed an IT mission that was do more, reach further, be better, because that was pretty much the same statement as the vision for the organization as a whole. So we were tying into that, into that vision. <clears throat> Making those connections are, are pretty important. Now, how do you do that? 
Well, Simon Sinek would say we start with why, but we also, uh, you know, we need to start with ideas. We need to brainstorm. And who is a master at brainstorming on an annual basis? Have you heard of Think Week? Bill Gates. If any of you have read you know, biographies on Bill Gates or Bill Gates practices, once a year, he invited employees to write him papers on things that Microsoft should be doing. And he would then go off on a cottage that he owned up in the, in the mountains, or it was on an island, I think. And he would do nothing but a week, 18 hour days, read these papers, and then come back with some you know, decisions on it. How many papers do you think he read? Did Kintaro send him a paper? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Kintaro did send him a paper, as a matter of fact. Yeah, yeah. He read, he read over 100 papers um, in, in that week. Um, and, and employees, you know, uh, I don't know, at that time, they may have been like 70, 75,000 employees at Microsoft, would kill to get you know, one of their papers in front of Bill Gates you know, to read. So it became a huge idea generation engine. And because he was such a ferocious reader, um, he then would take into, so the whole shift that Microsoft took <coughs> towards the internet happened rather quickly in the 90s, was due to a, one of these papers. <coughs> so here I said, it's, it's, it's twice yearly that he did it. I thought it was only once a year, <coughs> twice yearly. Um, and then he'd give you know, green lights on new technologies. Um, this was the paper, the Internet Tidal Wave, in 1995. Um, well, it was his, his paper, but that, that, that led to Microsoft to develop his Internet browser. That if everything was going to be delivered through the Internet, then what was Microsoft going to do to be a major player in the Internet space? And what did, he, what did the organization need to change to be that? It was a huge shift. <clears throat> that also creating the, their, their tablet PC, um, their video game business, the Xbox, and others were all came off of Think Week papers. Um, and this Wall Street Journal article was talking about that hey, four days in, he had read 56 papers, um, sometimes 18 hours a day. His record was reading 112 papers. He said, I don't know if I'll catch my record, but I certainly will do 100. Talk about a goal. I mean, how many papers do you read in a week for your, uh, for your master's program? He's reading a hundred of these things. Just uh, have you have you seen the um, is it Netflix that has the um, or the Amazon? Uh, who has the special on the mind of Bill Gates? It's, it's, it's Netflix. It's Netflix. Netflix. Yeah. If you have you seen how many have seen that? <clears throat> So in, in one of the images in that, in that show is him carrying the book bag that his assistant has filled the books he's going to read on his next trip. And it's bigger than, than, than my book bag, and it's filled with stuff that he's going to, to read. Um, it just, I, I, he's probably the example of a carnivorous reader. That, by the way, I think is an exception for CQs, particularly in tech companies. Um, and one of the papers that he read was 10 Crazy Ideas to Shake Up Microsoft. So this was, this was actually a Wall Street Journal uh, article uh, before he had actually re retired from uh, Microsoft. Um, so I said, okay, this is good enough for Bill Gates. And he said, a good example, I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm not gonna read 100 papers, but I invited my much smaller IT department to um, give me a list of questions and about positive changes, that was the emphasis that we could recommend. There was a new CEO who was coming on board uh, that summer, and so um, I went with, uh, with my wife to Taiwan to celebrate the Chinese New Year, and I said, well, one of the weeks I'm there, I'm going to do this. Do nothing but think and focus on those, that list of questions. And we, we had only had 28 uh, questions to start, but I had committed that I would write something on each one of those 28 questions. Um, the German poet uh, Rana Rilke had a wonderful phrase that I used as, as my guidepost on this, was that learn to love the questions. You know, before you think into the answers, learn to love the questions. And so, you know, what are good questions? 
Um, by the way, an interesting application of that to project management that you'll all be involved in is to ask what questions are we trying to answer with this project that we can't answer today or that are hard to answer? That if we complete this project, we're going to be able to answer those 10 questions, 8 questions really well. And then when you do the demo of the product, particularly to the management team, and you say, here's now we have the answers to each of those questions. And hopefully they're the ones who you've interviewed and they to develop those what that question was. And then if you demonstrate that you that the system will answer those eight questions, you automatically have adoption. Oh, I can use this to answer those questions that I helped develop from that list. So learning to love the questions ends up becoming rather practical advice for good IT management. Um, so the 28 questions, uh, these were my top five. So this is, a, again, this is influenced by Microsoft. How can we think big? Uh, that was the name of our department, the Information Services Division, department rather, ISD, um, and have impact on the new management team. Um, how do we get out of, get into, and move up on that IT strategy pyramid? Um, where can we save money and then reinvest it in technology uh, for, for new technologies? Um, data harmony, um, and then how can, we, um, how can we operate more efficiently if we have declining unrestricted funds? Unrestricted funds in a nonprofit organization are the funds that are available for doing administrative tasks that aren't tied to a particular grant. So grants typically are to accomplish a program like water, sanitation, health, education, et cetera. Um, and unrestricted funds are the ones that help to do everything else, like run, run management and, uh, and other parts of the organization. That you can cross over the, the two in some ways, and that was part of what we talked about. But that created a great deal of uncertainty if the key way our budgets were paid for was out of that money. How are we going to operate if that money in general and the whole sector was declining? <clears throat> and then determining some themes. So uh, the themes that we had was we said, you know, IT, rather than being a, um, a simply a service provider, which is down here, we provide internet connections, we provide laptops, we provide telephones. Um, we're going to be a convener and a advisor. So we're going to bring together field people together to have more conversations uh, about what they're technology desires are, how they're using distant technology. We're going to be a broker uh, and help to create partnerships uh, among different vendors that we had. Um, and then, so some of these cross over uh, from, from each of the level. But we want to modernize and we want to make efficient the IT enterprise. And remember before I said becoming more efficient is about doing the operational things in IT for less money. But at the same time, we need to modernize. We need to do more of the above the waterline iceberg types of things. Um, and we didn't, if we were continued to be viewed as a back office department that had only responsibility for uh, delivering laptops, internet connections, cell phones, et cetera, then we were never going to get out of this business at the bottom of the pyramid. If we were going to have more impact on the organization as a whole, we had to do more things uh, up at the top. And by playing these roles, and a variety of roles, was a way that we proposed that we could do that. So that's the get in, get out from before. Um, and this is a definition of each of those. Uh, the providers, the, the common way of IT operating that we were operating, probably Bill Palmer and his department is probably mostly on the provider side. Um, they're not being treated as an advisor or a subject matter expert in technologies and applications of technologies in other departments. I don't see evidence of that happening. Uh, convener bringing together various leaders um, to have overall impact on the organization and the sector. Um, and then broker, you know, how do we create those partnerships among uh, partners and vendors and platforms? Um, that other people can use and build things on. So the IT department is not just the sole provider, sole builder, but actually may help provide 
platforms that others can build on. So that's how we thought we were going to change. And the other way we looked at it was this, and this, this becomes important for one of the papers you're going to be working on, is um, the four-lane highway example. So Martha Heller, in her, uh, in her book, The CIO Paradox, talks about one of the CIO leaders saying the way he described the senior management, how IT systems could be classified was he said, you think of a four-lane highway. He said, in the, in the left-hand lane, you've got sort of motorcycles zipping in and out and you know, seem to be operating by their own standards. Um, taxis, you know, maybe in the high occupancy vehicle lane, you know, going fast, going to the airport. Buses carrying a lot more people, but, but not in that left lane, maybe more in the middle lane. And then trucks, which have a lower speed limit than the others, but they carry the most goods. And so um, the IT systems that carry most of the work of the organization, like the finance system, for example, the HR system, is probably a truck. Buses might be the HR system. Taxis, you know, pick something. Um, motorcycles are probably the new things that, that, you know, that people are, are picking up in some of the remote offices and experimenting with. We added to that the plus one because we were a disaster response organization were ambulances. That when there was a disaster, what happens? Everybody else pulls over to the side and lets this thing go through. So if we could do, classify our systems as to whether they were a truck, a bus, a taxi, a motorcycle, or an ambulance, then we could uh, and have discussions about how much of our budget we're investing in each and what the priorities are of those. Um, so here you can see the high plus priorities here, the high priorities for moving most of the goods of the organization. But what's the agility, really low agility of the trucks, really high agility of the, of the motorcycles? Um, now, most of the apps you use on your phones, where would you put that? Motorcycles. Motorcycles right? How often do apps come and go? You know, how many apps are there out there? <laughs> right? um, they're, and they're pretty flexible, right? You can delete an app, get another app. You know, it's, um, I forget how many apps I've got installed on my phone. And Apple does this really cool thing now where if you don't use it for a while, it sort of takes it out out of the memory of the phone, but leaves a little footprint there that you can click and download it again if you then want to use it. So it's conserving space really well, but it's a, it's a motorcycle. <coughs> so and then there's some other characteristics as well. I'm not going to dwell much on that. So emergency response was its own category. Um, local applications, so things that were happening, say, in Nairobi for the International Red Cross, they had an IT manager, an IT department. They might be doing some really interesting things, probably on the motorcycle level. But as they grew, <coughs> these things cross over. Motorcycles have a way of becoming taxis as more people use them. In Save the Children, we had an office that developed a local app for doing HR management. And then they showed it to some of the other offices, Thailand and Philippines, I think, were the two, who then adopted it and started using it. So that started to become a bus. We found out about it when the application failed and the person who wrote it had left the organization. And they called us at headquarters and said, can you help us fix this system? And our first response was, what system? You know, we didn't even know. But it needed to become a truck. Um, and so this migration of things, and this is a natural migration of things. So there's a tendency in some IT departments to say, I'm going to stamp out these things. I'm going to require that only people use those things. But one of the things to recognize is that sometimes innovation in an organization and change in an organization can happen by making some bets on some of these as they continue through their maturation process. So a hard thing for an IT manager to do is to learn how to say yes to some of these things instead of the, the knee-jerk reaction, which is to say no. But once you get up to the truck, then you've got to comply with the, the larger ecosystem. <clears throat> this full lane metaphor, as I said, is going to be important in the assignment. So that's why I've spent some extra time on it. This was another um, way, if we looked at now, we crossed that four lane highway with the roles of advisor, convener, and broker. We had 90 plus application systems running 
uh, in the Red Cross. And that was down at that level. That's the traditional IT provider truck down there. Um, and this is increasing IT risk and investment here and here. So this is the stuff that costs the most. But it's also the riskiest if it's, if it's the iceberg that's not attended to. But we needed to, to expand that and to look at doing things in these other areas as well. So we gave examples of some of these from other offices in the organization. Um, because people around this global organization were asking, how am I, you know, especially if they're doing IT in, uh, in Nairobi or in Bangkok, how am I going to fit into this? Where does my stuff fit in with this? And so this became a way of rationalizing and showing the relationship among those. <coughs> Thinking about change and transformation, this is uh, you know, largely what um, JL was talking about. I, I just put up our, our three takeaways for the course to point out that strategy is transformational, the emphasis on transforming from current state to future state, or from now into the destination. <coughs> and so our IT strategy at the Red Cross was do more, do better, reach further, be faster by becoming a digitally people-enabled business, which was a mouthful. We have to unpack exactly what that meant. And if I had to do it again, I would probably say that was still too complicated. It needed to be shorter. <coughs> and certainly about change. Um, yes, Mary. You, um, you're talking a little bit, maybe this is related. You were talking a little bit about like, once you use the enterprise level and still being able to look at the possibility of like, the office in Kenya um, and kind of once you're in this provider mode, uh -huh. how, did you, how did you all think about um, having to make consistency and making sure that people were up to date, even if the organization was pushing uh, software updates and pushing innovation, how did you enforce that option? Yeah, consistency, so consistency, we, we pushed more to the data level. Can we have consistency of data, consistency of data definitions? How, whether there were different applications or systems that used it. Um, you know, if we could show that there was a more cost-effective way of bringing those together, fine. But it was more important in the rapidly changing world to say, and I think Jay said a few things about this as well, with, to have consistency of data. And share the definition. I mean, you can't you can't aggregate data across a global organization if you have different definitions in each region. So you have to agree on, on the basic data definitions so that you can bring information together. Um, this is a consulting framework. I just threw this in here because it's, it's got the transformation aspects um, and you know anticipating the future, developing the future state, every consulting project typically tries to envision the future state, analyzes the current state, and then what's the gap between the current and future, usually then with a plan to how they get there. And so that's just a, that's a typical cycle of a consulting project, whether it's an external consulting firm or it's an internal consulting project, typically goes through those steps. I'm not gonna spend any time on SWAT because you just spent a bunch of time on SWAT, so all of the stuff is familiar here. Um, you can, when you're developing a, SWAT, a new SWAT for a new organization, you can ask the employees, the customers, and the consultants for what are some of the statements that we might put in, particularly on the weaknesses and threats in the column. You know, customers will tell you what your weaknesses are. Consult good consultants will also tell you what your weaknesses are. Um, and perhaps some of your strengths from both of them as well. So it's a large listening exercise. Um, you know, looking at the, again, the Scott and the hike cycle, you know, the question, particularly for a nonprofit strategy, is where do you get on the curve? Um, you know, as we said earlier, you don't want to, you don't want to be adopting technology here um, and then have it plummet <coughs> in the next year and you're the owner, you're the IT owner of it. Um, so there's a risk to when you jump on emerging technology. <coughs> so a good IT strategy includes good questions. So Gartner has these six questions. Um, so as you'll be analyzing, you'll be picking an organization and analyzing its IT strategy. 
Um, and part of that will be, you know, do they answer these questions? You know, from where are we going? Some of this is, is almost like painting the story or the journey of the organization. Uh, from where they're coming, um, how will we get there, what will we do, by when will we do it, how much will it cost? <coughs> Typical components of an IT strategy. Um, we added a bit to those. Um, the red ones are from the, the Gartner one, but then we added a few others, so we, had, we actually had 11 questions that our strategic document uh, answered. <coughs> time check. Oh, okay, we're on time. Um, so let me talk a bit about uh, measurement, which is the last component uh, in this unit. Um, so this is Carl Sewell, who wrote a, a, a wonderful book called Customers for Life. He has the largest Lexus and other car dealerships in Dallas, Texas, I think. Um, and, and in this book about customers for life, he, he talked about a friend of his that he was working with in a summer job. His friend was working in a soup canning factory, probably like a Campbell soup factory, which is why I picked that, that picture. Um, and to avoid the monotony of the job, because his job was to load the tops that go on the cans of soup into the, into the, the machine, and he'd have to watch it so that when, the, as, the, as the lid started to come down, he had to have the next one ready to go in. That was his summer job. I, I think I'd kill myself. <laughs> it's, it's a hot cans of soup, and, and it has to worry about getting the lids uh, into the machine. Um, and so after four days, he started keeping, so he says, I'm gonna just count how many lids a day. After four days, he said, I'm gonna try to beat my best day how many lids, and, uh, and then figuring out how many lids he'd have to load to achieve the record pace. Right? So he turned it into a game. And after a week, he had the most productive machine in the factory, and he was playing against himself. And the supervisor came in and said, what are you doing? <laughs> he said, you have by far the fastest line, production line, in the organization. And all he was doing to keep from going crazy was counting lids. That point is, is that counting things can be incredibly motivating and can be incredibly important to driving productivity. And IT departments have lots of things that can be measured. Um, so one of the questions is, you know, what are your lids, you know, in your IT organization? Trouble ticket. Sorry? Trouble ticket. Trouble ticket. <laughs> yeah. Trouble ticket may be one of the, maybe one of the common lids, yeah. Um, we picked one lid, we called it um, the good day number. And a good day number was how many, um, if a day was defined as good, if there was no pain point outage, that could be planned system you know, changes and upgrades, but if there was an outage that caused users pain, that was a bad day. And if there were no outages that caused users pain, that was a good day, and we just counted good days and graphed number of good days in the month. That ended up being a more meaningful measure than, um, uh, than uptime. Traditional IT measure is, you know, my uptime of my system is 99.9% .9 availability in the system. It says nothing about user pain. Because if the 0.1% was on the day the organization was closing its monthly books, and it was the finance system that went out for 60 minutes or 30 minutes. That's a lot of pain for the finance department, right? Would never show in the uptime report. Would still be like, I like did something. But the pain index would be a bad day. So, um, what about us from Phoenix? Big obvious one, ship Phoenix, get it out the door, right? Support a successful launch, high quality Phoenix project, ship it on time and on budget, and develop a release process that minimizes work in progress and delivers value to our customers. This work in progress ends up being a pretty important measure in the Phoenix story, so you'll it's come back again and again. <coughs> we set SMART goals. How many have heard of SMART goals? They've been around for a while. Right? So, Specific, measurable, actionable, responsible, time bounds. Sometimes there's different words that are used here, but essentially it's the what, what I call the target, the how, the who, and the when. 
So in setting objectives in the IT department, and you don't get hung up on the semantics of, you know, so what exactly is the difference between a goal and a priority and objective and, you know, uh, uh, a goal, a, a smart objective, smart goal, et cetera. Um, some of these are short term, some of them are long term, and that's probably enough, although to use them interchangeably. Um, this is actually from one of my um, objectives sheets. Um, it's a piece of it, it actually went longer than just these five. Uh, when I was the chief technology officer at Save the Children. Um, and what I looked at, what we had defined here was, we, it's not in the order of SMART, but in red you'll see specific, responsible, time-bound, actionable, measurable, and that's the, the what, the who, the when, the how, and the target. So a good question to ask yourself as an IT manager or as a project manager as well, is in my objectives, do I, have I clearly specify them, who's responsible, who's the owner? There can only be one owner. There may be many participants, but there's one owner. Um, when's it due? Um, <coughs> and the actual steps, measurable steps. Now, interestingly, in your education experience, you have all of those aspects, right? You have specific things you need to do in each class, assignments you need to complete, et cetera. You're responsible for it, or if you're in a team, the team is responsible for it. It's got a deadline on it. Ultimately, you've got to finish things by the semester, you know, in the semester, right? Um, and, you know, it's got actionable steps, and it's clearly measurable. There are things called grades and points and stuff on it. So some of this is applying what you're already familiar with in the education environment, applying it to the IT work. Now, notice we've gone from a very high level of vision down to a very specific level of, you know, what, how are we defining the objectives down at the task level? What are we assigning for people to do? So goals and objectives have been around for a while, management by objectives in 1967, smart goals started to come in around 1981, key performance indicators is another one, balanced scorecards is another thing that came in, um, and then now OKRs, which are popular at Google, um, and I'm going to forget exactly what that acronym OKR stands for. Objective. Right there, objectives and key results. <laughs> um, is the update to it, uh, but when I started to read more about it, it seemed to me that OKRs seemed to be another version of MBOs. Um, so, and this happens in technology. You would not think that it happens in technology, but it certainly happens in management. Things tend to, tend to cycle around. Um, particularly as consulting organizations are coming up with new methods and ways of doing things, uh, they often study the, some of the old methods and say, well, maybe we can update that old one and we'll bring it in. Um, we see this in the product world uh, where there's retro products. Um, and restoration hardware is a great example of a, of a whole organization that made its money by bringing products to market that were products that existed 50 years ago. <clears throat> um, I like to do this from time to time, and it's one of the tools as an IT manager is to use Google Trends, trends.google.com. And you can put in search terms or topic terms. You see I've got search terms here. So I put in SWOT analysis, OKR, MBO, and balanced scorecard. SWOT seems to be percolating along, you know, it's still pretty popular, um, you know, MBOs, which are the yellow line is flat, balanced scorecards have been declining, and OKR, you know, a bit of a slow you know, uptick as well. So one of the points is, is that the technique you pick for setting and tracking objectives, there's a fad aspect to it. You know, some of these, so the question you should ask is, well, what's gonna work well with my organization? What you want, though, is to pick something that it's clear, particularly clear to your, the members of your team, it's clear whether you succeed or not. There is partial credit, too, but you know, to see if you, you know, to be clear about it. People want to know, have I accomplished this objective? During a performance review, you typically talk about those things. We'll talk about performance reviews later in the class. Um, and if you can point to some metrics that indicate that you've accomplished those, all the better. But it also makes it clearer to you. What do, I, what do I need to do? I need to do things that make the needle move on this measure. Okay. 
<laughs> balance scorecards, they're balanced between having financial measures, customer measures, internal processes, and then knowledge and growth measures. And these, these are the questions of balance scorecards. I consulted with organizations on balance scorecards for about a 10-year period. Um, and as indicated in the prior slide, this is sort of come and gone. Um, this is some stuff about KPIs. Um, you know, the point is it's not a to-do item, it's a result. You know, what result in, happens? So this is something, by the way, that's a challenge when you're writing your resume. In a resume, you typically put down what experiences you've had. But have you put down what impact you've had? If you're working on an internship or you're working on a job, what impact did your work have? If you're working on a school project, what did you learn? You know, the, these are things that are more results rather than just the traditional activities of a resume. There is a, there's a problem in management called the activity trap. If our employees are saying, oh, we're, we're busy, we're working around the clock, great, tell me the results you deliver. And a radical way of framing that is, I don't care if you work four hours a day, if you're delivering the best results, have fun at the beach. No, doesn't quite happen that way. <laughs> but you know, the, the point is, is the question we have in performance review discussions is tell me about the results you delivered. Um, so tell me about the impact you had on your job. Tell me about what you learned in a project. Um, that's a resume that's different. And part of what you're doing marketing-wise on a resume is you're standing out. Some people do that in a cover letter. Some people do that with a sidebar sort of an about me sidebar in a resume. But the problem is, is that most resumes today are what we call cookie cutter. They all look the same. They all read the same, and they all lend themselves to computer programs that read them and determine whether, in fact, you've checked all the boxes for that job description. So I wrote an article about the tale of two resumes. Write one that's going to pass the computer program. And write another one that's a marketing piece. And I'll give you, and I have a website in my article where you can look at 50 different resume formats, some of which are really eye popping, particularly for designers. That just the resume just screams for its look and feel or design. Um, and so the question is when you go face to face in the interview and you leave a resume behind, that's the one you want to stand out. So when the manager collects all the resumes and puts them in a pile, what one stands out? what looks the same. You don't want to look the same when you're selling yourself. It's like a product, right? If all, tel if all smartphones have exactly the same ad and exactly the same description, how would, how would you decide what one to get? <coughs> so this is, you know, when we go to the doctor, the doctor takes vital signs. There's a good book on measurement called Vital Signs about that. And then we use these type of measures. I'll talk about that on, on the next slide. So in defining measures for an IT department or for actually any department in an organization, um, I used to refer to these as the QTCQ measures. There's quantity measures. How many things are we producing? What's, what's the count of the objective? Timeliness. You know, did, by when did we get it done? Uh, what was the cost? And then the quality, how effective? What was the customer rating in the public, for example? And so measures can, can be categorized in these four buckets uh, for an overall picture. So if you want to look for a more well-rounded picture on your project, for example, uh, you might want to ask some questions about the project, about quantity, timeliness, cost, and quality. And one of the quality ones may be a survey, uh, you know, an index card survey you give to the users uh, a couple weeks after they've had the product in the release. And one of the top questions that people ask now, I ask it on, on class evaluations, on a one to 10 scale, how likely are you to recommend this product to a friend or a colleague? <coughs> and studies have shown that the one to five ratings are detractors from your product, and the nines and tens are promoters of your product. And the middle is between five and, and eight are, are considered the, uh, the, uh, the, the neutral side. Um, so you may get, how many have gotten a question from an airline or a company that have asked 
on a one to ten, how likely are you to recommend this service or this product? Have anybody got a friend you don't want to go on? There's okay, so a few of you have gotten it. Um, you'll see it <laughs> time to time, it'll pop up. Yeah, where it is. I feel like the, like the concept of the net promoter score is something that a lot of organizations are moving towards. Yeah. So that's exactly what I described, that one to 10 scale. It's called net promoter score. If you want to read about it, it originated at Bain and Company, a consulting company. Um, and uh, it is used, if you get on a Delta plane, so at Detroit Airport, if you get on a Delta plane, you will see some of those ratings on decal on the plane next to the door. Next time you get on, on a plane, look to see what's on the decal next to the door. You'll see JD Power rating <coughs> of, and, and you know, and, and this rating of. So organizations, uh, it's really important for them to know what do their customers think of them, and it's important for IT departments to know what do your customers think of you, right? <coughs> this is a so for OKRs, I sort of like this is the football example, um, and. Um, that um, Dewar, the author of this, uh, who worked with Google, you know, developed, is that you know the general manager has an objective to make more money for the owners, key results, win the Super Bowl, and fill the stands at 88 percent. Those are the measures, and it goes down to the head coach and the head of PR, and then it goes down to the individual teams, and you know like special teams, 25-yard uh, punt, punt return average, uh, three blocked punts, you know, as, as an example, um, and. This is in individual objectives and team objectives. This is how they connect to then the overall. And that's a key aspect of OKR is this, that top to bottom connection uh, among all. So when you ask the question or one of the people on the team says the question, how am I contributing to the overall success of the organization? It's well, if I do these things really well and my peer groups do these things really well, um, the organization as a whole is gonna do well. So, conclusion, start with ideas, develop themes, focus on change, apply the tools, ask good questions, detail the objectives and the measures, <coughs> and then again, this consulting mandate that strategy transforms an organization from the current state to the future state. <coughs> People are filtering in. This was the collage of the whiteboard for which I took one rotten photograph on uh, number three. Um, but I transcribed this into the chart matrix that's going around on the left hand side. So those were the seven questions. That was the Shackleton movie um, answers. Um, so it was these things you see on the left hand side of that sheet. Um, and you remember the, the map in terms of what the original destination was, what the revised destination was, and the point that strategy changes as the context changes. So um, what we're gonna do now is um, break up into teams, two to four people on a team, um, and take those matrix and write in on the right-hand side what you've learned about Bill Palmer for each of those seven questions. And we'll just take a, uh, it'll probably take less than 10 minutes to go through and write down as many things as you can think of on that right hand side. And then we'll go to the whiteboard and write them down.
they so, help along the way they are finding other issues that they So there's some prerequisites that they have to fix, is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like one of those prerequisites is do they have a stable infrastructure in operation to launch on, it, right? We'll find out more about about the route as Eric does his magic. Anybody else have something else on route? Yes. We also Eric. said because of like the route and the distance, so for distance we said two weeks. Ah, all right. That would also be, be related to the to the goal too. Huh? All right, intervening objectives. So, what new things objectives popped up in the middle of this so far? Then the audit. Uh, audit. Okay. Maria, Maria. Mm -hmm. Clarifying the assignments? Kind of, yeah. Kind of. <laughs> All right, let's hold that in reserve. <laughs> what else? All right, this is probably a number of obvious things here. What about the operational issues? What's, what's, what's derailing this? Stephen? Uh, communication. Yeah. Tell me, expand on that a little bit. What do you mean by that? Um, it just seems like every department has like their own way of operating. It's really like unempathetic to the way that other teams are organized. Ah, uh, so silos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Good. What else? Not enough resources. Sorry. Not enough resources. Uh -huh. West keeps you on about it. Okay. What about strategy changes and any improvisations? Have you seen anything like that? Yes. When they start organizing the uh, changes in the note cards. Yeah. So that's like an improvised solution. Aha. Uh -huh. So the note card, I'll call it note card project management. <laughs> What, what exercise did we do that the note card description of the book reminds you of? The, the post-its? Yeah, the post-its and the dots, right? So what they're doing is making very visible each of the projects. They're starting to put uh, <coughs> criteria on them just so they can sort projects, right? They're, they're moving towards what's called developing a Kanban board, you know, on, on, but it's physically on a big whiteboard in a conference room where everybody can, can gather around. And one of the advantages, because I'm working on a project team now, we're using Trello. Trello's great, but it's, but where do you get together to have the, the conversations around it or about it? And what we're finding is that the meeting we have weekly to talk about the project ends up being recorded in Trello <laughs> afterwards. But it's the conversation about it, gathering together around it, that ends up being rather important. And that's you're seeing that happening in the Phoenix <coughs> project. So sometimes low tech has an interesting positive impact on high tech. It's a rather low tech method they're using. But it gets everybody together, and it gets them to visually see what's happening in a more holistic way. Yeah. Any other comments? Yes. I would say the last one, they took a lot of things off of prints, like table or things to do, so we would just focus on the Phoenix project. Uh, yes. So reduce. Brent's demands or demands on Brent, right? 
it ends up that, that um, he ends up being the key bottleneck. Is it starting to become apparent? Yeah, you'll hear more about that. Yeah. And maybe because of that, they also realize that um, they do have the resources, but they haven't underutilized yeah. because they, all the knowledge is contained in that person. Are they using the talent in the, in the right areas? So the, 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 the way that Jim Collins talks about this is, do you have everybody on the bus that you need, number one? Number two, do you have everybody in the right seat? Right. Sometimes the problem that Brent is, is you sit in too many seats. And the sales and marketing department thinks that he's uh, you know, dedicated to them. Right? Uh, that gets worse, by the way. So the, the story takes a few more, more interesting turns. OK. So one of the things you see is that some of the leadership issues and management issues actually have some similarities between two radically different situations, crossing the South Pole and getting stuck, versus having a, a, a major project that's doing a crash and burn. And that's the point, is that some of these principles that you start to observe in one, you, you think about applying to another. And so thinking about what Shackleton did can be applied to Bill, and you'll see more evidence of that as these, these next chapters uh, unfold. Great, okay. Um, my battery is low, I just love this, okay. That means we're gonna finish quickly. Um, all right, we already did the report outs, and we've done the comparisons. Ah, there is, um, I'm gonna send this to you um, on, uh, on Canvas. And the question I have is that these different types of leaders, um, which, which leader is, is Palmer most like and which leader is uh, Shackleton most like? So, um, and, yeah, okay. um, I'll, I'll post on Canvas the uh, results of the index card surveys. Thank you for everybody for doing those this week. Because one of the things on the index card surveys is <coughs> end by 8.20. And so it's just about 8.20, and so uh, I'm not going to, to belabor this further. The next couple of slides was just about the index cost survey, next steps that we're taking, um, upcoming assignments, which is the same as what I listed uh, last week as well. Okay, so honoring the clock, I'll call it a class. Thank you very much. And your next step, so you had volunteered to summarize the next Yes. Are you volunteering? I was just helping to remind you. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. Do you, would you like to do it, or somebody else have a burning desire to do it? Very gracious. I'll do it. Very nice. Okay, great. Super. Thank you. Thank you for the reminder. I'll get you next week. <laughs>